Hi, Patricia. How are you? I'm really well. How are you? Yeah, great as well. I love that energy. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm very happy to have you on this podcast and very thank you for your time. I've been actually following you on LinkedIn for quite a while now and I really wanted to interview you on private equity uh, because it's an asset class that is less well known to the average investor, but I have the impression there's a few initiatives to make it much more accessible and I thought it was the occasion to actually share knowledge um, so if I say a bit about you, so you're based in Zurich and you're the co-founder and partner of Falco Global Partners, uh, where you invest in scale-up companies, uh, which means they have at least 20% growth annually. You also support young entrepreneurs and serve as supervisory board member of several startups. Before that, you started your career as a broker, then private banker, portfolio manager, and you also spent 12 years as a financial news anchor for CNBC. You've been featured in a few magazines as a strong businesswoman, and you've just created Mentorit TV, where you interview the most brilliant visionaries and industry leaders in their respective fields. So that's a lot, <laughs> right? Oh my God. Uh, did I really do all that? <laughs> <laughs> uncle, uncle. Oh my God. I didn't really realize. Yes. No, no, absolutely true. Well researched. <laughs> that sounds good. So let, let's talk about private equity. So as I said, it's a less well-known asset class than equities or bonds because it used to be pretty inaccessible, um, which means you needed like big entry tickets. So it's essentially an investment in private companies that are not listed on a public stock exchange. And the industry in itself does not, does not necessarily have the best reputation in the way that we often hear about value squeezes, big financial profit searches, and, and even people being led off. So you being in that world, what's your view and, and what's your definition? Now, I think that view, that reputation uh, of private equity companies looking for value extraction as a way to value uh, creation uh, has definitely um, left a little bit of a mark on the industry. And whilst it is true that financial analysis in buying alternative assets, alternative, why? Because they're not publicly traded, as you were rightly saying, Rika. And so that um, basically you buy companies, you look at their balance sheets, you look at their numbers, and straight away, you tend to have the financial engineering mode when you go through this process and see, okay, where can we extract value from whatever asset we buy? And often that means that companies can be run better, more efficient, more profitable and usually that equates to pulling costs out making anything more efficient or digitalizing things often means human and talent loss absolutely right and i think that we might be in in a little bit of a situation where this is changing or improving and this is where falco global partners also tries to make a difference that whilst it is super important to have your financial analysis but that is only one part of the equation when you go into private assets buying a company and there are different ways you can buy companies and different stages you can buy a company at then of course you look at the financials but you need to look at also the entire value chain in terms of where are cracks and where can we add value, intrinsic value. And this is where we get into the value creation debate, which I think is right from sourcing companies, from the due diligence, an important aspect to consider when buying or not buying an asset. Just that to, to talk about the reputation. Mm -hmm. The second point you mentioned, it is an asset class that is not very accessible, spot on. Um, private equity or venture capital of course, uh, industries that most of the time, maybe not venture capital, but private equity for sure, deal with multi-billion dollar businesses. And if you look at private equity as an asset class within alternative investments, what you have are private equity funds. And the structure of them are actually really simple. Everybody thinks it's really difficult. Uh, it's actually not. You do have a fund which is managed by something that is called the general partner. So if you and I say, hey, let's have a private equity fund, then we are the general partners. We are responsible for setting up the fund, the fund structure, registering it, and then managing it. And then we say, okay, we need a few investors. We need to get out there and raise capital. And whoever comes in as an investor are LPs, 
limited partners. So they will buy basically into our fund, give us money so we can go out shopping, you and I. Yeah. Okay, so if we have a Italian luxury private equity fund, you and I would try to get a piece of Gucci or a piece of um, whatever Italian bread is hot right now or is going to be hot tomorrow. So that is the basic structure. Why is it difficult to get in? Usually private equity funds or funds in general, they start only making money on the fees when they have 100 million US dollars under assets, uh, under assets under management plus, because then is when a fund kind of breaks even. So usually when you look at private equity, they try to raise 300 million, half a billion. We are raising right now a, a fund which is between one and 1.3 billion US dollars big. That means you cannot necessarily have our lovely neighbor, even though we love Catherine so much, come in and invest $2,500 in order to add to it, because otherwise we would have a gazillion mm-hmm. of investors, all right, and we would never finish the fundraising. But there's there's another avenue. So what you do is in private equity funds, often you have a minimum ticket of $25 million US dollars. And there's institutional investors, pension funds, mutual funds, ultra high net worth individuals that have that kind of cash to deploy. On the other side, if you and I, as normal retail investors, everyday investors, would like to get involved in the Italian luxury brand fund, we could go through a feeder fund. A feeder fund is nothing else but a bank saying, okay, I'm going to get the small guys, pull them all together. And once I have a batch of 25 million, they can then be registered as a block within the private equity fund. And then when the when it comes to the profit distribution, we'll see to that later on. Okay. So mm-hmm. that is basically what the big caveat is to get into private equity. However, as I was saying earlier on, um, there are different ways even for Joe Blocks to go in. You can go through a fund of funds. So that would be you and I, we buy a piece of a fund that invests into funds like ours, for example. So the only thing you need to be careful of is, of course, your fee structure gets really expensive. That at the end of the day, you know, I buy the fund of funds. The fund of fund buys the fund. The fund buys the actual equity, the company underneath. Daddy, yaddy, yaddy, yeah. Every time you have, mm-hmm. a, you know, a, a step in between another transaction another fee structure. So you have to see whether the return on your investment as an investor, especially a private it's investor. Better. Exactly. Mm-mm. But makes sense. So, so we'll go through all of that like later on, but super, super clear. And thank you so much for giving like the broad overview. It's it's super, it's super clear. So, so PE as well fun into two categories. So the venture capital or called VCs and the leverage buyout. So can mm-hmm. you give us a bit more details and what you do um, for your fund? Yes. Okay. So that's really, really a good question. And I think one really needs to be a little bit more precise when it comes to, okay, investing in alternative, uh, alternative investments or private equity. Leverage buyouts, they have been around for donkey's years, okay? And they got into a real bad reputational negative vortex in the financial crisis of 2008, you know, the, when, when everything basically in the US blew up because everything was too leveraged. There was just too much debt and too little equity to hold that debt or kind of hold that collateral for that debt. And this is exactly what leveraged buyout uh, private equity is. So you and I, we want to buy, let's say, um, Tommy Hilfiger, okay? We think there is lots of value in buying the whole thing. So leveraged buyouts, first of all, always takes a majority stake, if not the entire company. So it really is a change in ownership. But you and I, we only have $10 million, but we need a billion. I'm exaggerating now. Yeah, yeah. So what you have in terms of the financial underneath, the financial structure of doing a deal under the leveraged buyout is you have a 90 to 10 debt to equity ratio. So we have 10% of the money between you and I. But 90% of the money we need to get from banks, we need to get from financial institutions. You and I, we would issue bonds, which are actually labeled as as junk bonds, okay? Mm -hmm. And so you would ask, okay, so why would a financial company get into something like this? You know, lending you 90% 
of the asset value and you only give in 10% worth of cash. Well, simply because whatever asset you buy. So if you and I, we buy a Tommy Hilfinger, if things go wrong, Tommy Hilfinger belongs to the banks. It's a bit like a mortgage. Okay. Mm. You, if you yeah. can't pay your mortgage, they get your house and you and I, we sit on the street. Huh? So that is a leverage buyout. Um, this is really for the big guys. As I said, it got a little bit into a reputation 2008. And I think this is when more and more the term private equity was substituting leverage buyouts just in terms mm -hmm. of brand and label and reputation. <laughs> okay. All right. That makes sense. Um, that is that. Venture capital uh, is, um, so here two, import two important things to remember. A, how much leverage and B, that you actually buy the majority of the company. Mm -hmm. And then you try to extract value by streamlining it is streamlining it through the value chain cutting costs uh maybe some carve out spin-offs or whatever you make it to do a little jewel and then flog it and about the timeline of investment we'll talk a little later on maybe as well venture capital is um seriously can go from high risk to i think medium risk that's that's the the, the lowest risk i would see in that and and this is also what we do in um, Falco Global. So venture venture capitalists, we can, um, you and I, we have a friend and she has a fantastic idea and she wants to do a um, platform for everybody that loves knitting jumpers, okay? So you have an old economy, knitting jumpers with wool, but you have it on a technological platform. So that makes the whole thing disruptive and innovative, whatever she thinks it is. And she comes to us and says, hey, you're my friends or you are the fools, or maybe we are the families. Can you give me some startup capital, maybe 50,000, because I want to do X, Y, Z, and then start creating the company behind my idea. That would be a pre-seed kind of venture. So she does. she's not even a company yet. She has an idea. She comes to us, the triple F, <laughs> family, friends, and fools, raises a little bit of cash to create a company, to show a little bit what she wants to do, and then you know, kind of grow further into seed capital where a lot of venture capital funds go into as well. These are small companies. They might not even have revenue. They have half a prototype, fantastic vision, fantastic team. And we're like, oh my God, we are so in love with this company, with the entrepreneur. And then we give them a little bit of money. Okay, that's venture <laughs> capital. So you have extremely high risk because it literally is, it is like the lottery. You can lose 100% the you know the company goes bust and that's it there are no guarantees but of course you expect that you have a hockey stick type of return in that investment and this is where the entire greed comes if you and i would have invested into spotify or into flixbus or into twitter or back then into google oh my god would we be sitting here <laughs> mm -hmm. or just surfing surfing at the algarve uh, i think the latter you know so that is venture capital and then Within that, you can go into companies that are a little bit more mature, young, that these are, these are the scale-up or growth companies. The risk is a little less because they have their first clients. They're definitely beyond proof uh, of concept. They have clients. They have some return. Maybe they are not in the green yet. They don't have actual EBITDA, but they are fairly close or show the way within the next few years, even few months, that there will be a break even. They have a great client pipeline list. And on the other side, they have the funds, the liquidity to deliver onto their orders. So cash flow is also very important. Mm -hmm. And then you have the pre-IPO, so series A, B, C, pre-IPO, where you invest, medium risk, the company's up and running, has clients, has profits, looks good. People on the stock exchange, private investors are already waiting. Hey, I want to get my hands onto um, Pinterest. Yeah, or Peloton, because I know this company is going to be good in the long term. And finally, me as a normal investor can get in. So that's a pre-IPO stage. And then that that is more or less the broader, not too detailed, broader range of venture capital. And again, thank you so much, because it's so clear. And, and, I, and I love taking perspective, so putting things into context. And yeah, so well done. And, and so how do you invest yourself in companies? What are your key metrics? Okay. 
Um, of course, the key metric is ka-ching, 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 <laughs> <laughs> which would be nothing else but trying to make an IRR, which is your internal rate of return, which is a is a fundamental metric when you invest in, in, in private assets. But I think the key metrics, um, you have to look, again, a little bit different if you are in venture capital, okay, what metrics you have. Most of the time, you only have two metrics, and that is an entrepreneur and his vision. <laughs> and that is really as as bare it can be, and you buying into the team. So when we buy companies, we we buy into the team, we buy into the vision. And for us, in terms of how to put this into the mega trends that we see going forward, growing, where are the tendencies geographically? For example, for us, India is super hot and we are now collaborating with partners down there. For us, the fastest rate of return and growth is Asia, yet the biggest market is still, still the US. So you're differentiating there geographically. Then for us, there's no investment without technology. That's it, full stop. We cannot stop it. It's about digitization. It's about automation. It's about, of course, with that, the AI, data analytics. No data, no business, mm -hmm. all right? And and this data, and then you say, okay, so where's the human capital there? All oh, the human capital is so prevalent to make all of this work because data without anybody making sense out of the data or making it into a new business revenue stream, selling it or getting the data in, is nothing all right so technology for us is extremely important geography is important to analyze the team is important to analyze the vision and then of course you also look a little bit at what can we extract in terms of long-term intrinsic value from the investment in an ESG kind of uh, realm and it is so blah this whole ESG but you look at statistics you look at what people are thinking about the perfect storm we've seen all these uh, you know force majeure happening across the globe it's a given that ESG you know the the environment the social and the governance are the structures that need to be a given but not only in terms of yeah it's nice on the prospectus or the white paper or whatever it needs to be actually detectable in the entire value chain. So if you and I want to invest in a coffee company, you and I, we would go to Costa Rica and speak to whoever plants the coffee plants and generates the beans, what sort of soil, what sort of fertilizer, how long, who do you employ, how do you transport, and kind of try to make sure it falls into our overall global ethical, um, moral, and actual business environment and structure we are building to be sustainable. And again, people have abused this word so much, what sustainable actually means. It just means if I look back, it's still there, okay? If I look back at 2008, then I know a lot of things are not there anymore because they were built without thinking about, is it going to be around in 20 years? Nobody cared because we had a good rate of return. Mm -hmm. So from, from that point of view, I think these are the metrics that we look at in the venture capital, hmm? human, vision, uh, digital, long-term uh, values from really from creation to then selling it off. Mm. In terms of, sorry. No, 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 because yeah. yeah, you were talking about like the long-term vision and it's true. We're often talking about seven years in private equity. So can you kind of explain the investment process? And as an investor, you basically commit funds, but there's a lag before it's actually invested. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I think this is super important that you ask this because um, you can approach it from a uh, institutional investor's point of view or a private investor's point of view. So for an institu institutional investor like the limited partners going into uh, a, a private equity fund like ours, now the protection fund, they know that a private equity fund duration is about 10 years, sometimes 10 years and beyond. And there are, you know, all shades of gray, but, uh, gray simply because there's a secondary market, which I'm going to touch on as well. So, but... If you go into private equity fund, just don't count on your money for the next 10 years. Why? 
what happens is, and we are just uh, uh, in the pre-marketing phase of ours, uh, is that first of all, you create your idea, you create the structure in Luxembourg of the fund, then you create your marketing papers into showing to show your future investors, the limited partners, what your fund idea is uh, and what sort of companies would be in there. So you have to kind of have already a pipeline creation. You'd say, okay, you give us money and we buy XYZ company. Yeah, under this and that theme of the fund. So the process is they give us a certain amount of money. Usually you look for an anchor investor. If you have a billion dollar fund, your anchor investor would be about 100, 150, best 200 million. And at that point, you already have enough fire, firepower to buy your first couple of companies, to charge fees, to have the team. And the team needs to do a few things, but very, very um, structured sourcing deals, doing the due diligence on it, meaning analyzing from A to Z, the numbers, the vision, the past, the skeletons in the closet, buying the deal, right? And then putting it into the fund and kind of what we do as Falco Global Partners and General Partners, we manage, co-manage these companies on an operational level from day one of the purchase. And then you keep these accumulation of different companies. We are going to hold between... 12, 13 companies in it. And then this is the kind of uh, phase of investment period. It can go up to five years that you find the right deals, that you buy the companies. So it is growing in terms of assets. Is it growing in terms of me getting any money back? Mm -mm. The harvesting period at earliest can be about five years and then plus. Mm -hmm. Of course, caveat for everybody that listens to us. The secondary, secondary market is not to be ignored. And I actually love that market also as a marketing tool for a private equity fund. Yes, yeah, yeah, of course. 10 years, your money is gone. You just trust us, you know, and, and, and pray. Or you have the possibility to sell your commitment, your share in the fund, or your commitment of future installments of your money as the, the fund grows to another private equity company. Yeah. And so you get your cash back at that point, maybe not the same amount, the biggest amount like you would have gotten after 10 years, but you get a considerable amount of money. Otherwise, you wouldn't want to sell, perhaps, unless you're distressed yourself and you need your money out. And then the secondary partner will hold their stake. Why would a secondary private equity company be interested in your stake? Well, better, better due diligence already done. There's a track record on the company. Um, there might be a better price available. And there are other, other aspects that I, because I'm not in the secondary market, a secondary market player could tell you more about. So that would be the in investment process or the structure. Mm -hmm. Venture capital. This is how I started as a business angel. Um, and, uh, and the funny thing is, you know, when when working for CNBC, we were not allowed to to um, buy shares or you know anything that we could somehow influence because of uh, data sensitive data. Um, so I was always flabbergasted at how much an individual shareholder would be hostage to some sort of wave up or wave down without being able to do anything apart from okay selling at the wrong point or buying at the wrong point but you know it's very hard for a private uh, investor to to somehow have a hand on your investment so i said okay i'm going to buy private you know private companies directly sit on the board and help not only in terms of money, but also in terms of my experience, my connections, my my you know, the, the operational you know contribution in whatever they need to create value of the company. Hence, I have a little bit of an influence of the money I invested, and this is how I got into venture capital. Venture That's capital, interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is how you know you maybe only invest fifty thousand or hundred thousand, okay? But there, the upside, of course, is interesting. It can all go bust, as I said, highly risky, and you need to really see this as lottery money hmm? and um, not expect dividends after three years, not my, sometimes after five years. But the popularity is, of course, big because people are greedy and they think that they're going to invest in their next big thing, their next big 
unicorn and that is like 99.2 percent not the case <laughs> let me yeah. tell you that much <laughs> yeah but it's good again to put it back in context because we we can have like overconfidence and yeah have the run but no and um performance wise so in private equity funds we have a wide range of um returns depending on quartiles and it's actually the biggest um differences across all alternative asset classes in other words it means that you need to pick the right team behind the fund as the top quartile funds could have let's say 25 percent of return on average but the bottom one will get maybe six percent so the, the difference is absolutely huge so how as an investor can we pick the right fund or the right team behind it i don't know we have to ask the angels that <laughs> I tell you that much it is you know it's exactly that to see a stock picker uh, approach but just in the approach approach of private private equity or venture capital it's true there's a huge range um of potential returns and you know what would you what you would say is a good irr is 20 percent plus okay you can get more than that depending on geography. For example, when I speak to an average uh, ultra high net worth Indian investor, he'd expect 25% plus. I'm like, mm, solo? Okay, that's a bit of pressure, you know, to kind of, you can never guarantee, but unless you show the roadmap, how you would get 25% in return or above that, this guy will not invest. So that is one thing. Okay. So the expectations and the possibility to actually get high returns depends very much on geography and industry. And if you look again at where funds are investing, what the mega trends are, and this is why we created the protection fund. We, we for example, thought, okay, what are people scared of? What are what does the perfect storm really mean for us? We feel vulnerable as humans. Our our earth is suffering. It's vulnerable. So we said we're going to do the security and protection fund and invest in companies that try to sort out these mega problems and that are mega trends, be it the you know uh, protection of human capital, uh, of the planet, of infrastructure, of cybersecurity, you know, and and all of this to basically see these are industries that for the status quo we have right now, be it environmentally, um, as a human race, and also in terms of technological development is going to carry on. This is going to go and be a theme. And then within that, pick your jewels, mm -hmm. all right? And that is super hard. And I can tell you, the moment you pick your jewel, of course, you're already in love with your jewel, which blinkers your assessment, <laughs> okay? Yeah. But but even if you think you picked your jewels, after two years, you know, the uh, the entrepreneur, the CEO can just get whatever idea and just totally escapes your 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 influence your good see reasoning your good uh, trying to give him some input because you're a minority shareholder in venture capital and he says yeah you may think that i got your money anyway bye i'll do what i think is right which is not the case if you of course have a leveraged buyout mm -hmm. situation and you are boss and you just do what needs to be done so coming back to what you say how do i pick the good one past never equals the future Pass in the sense that the old private equity, you can't save your way to growth. That's what I, you know, what I always think about, right? You cannot save your way to growth. You can save your way to, let's say, a break even or a kind of a homeostasis, yeah? a party party situation, but then you need to invest and you need to build intrinsic value. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if that possibility is given, then you have a better chance. But really, it is a day to day quite hands-on management to try to make sure, and this is why operations and the operational input and the operational process, even control and fine tuning is so important to create this value long-term. If you only get the operations in, if things hit the fan, then you know it's always like an on-off on -off situation where you kind of like just balance your way through hopefully a good exit makes total sense thank you and um let, let's talk about the environment now so with the cost of debt rising how is it impacting the, the PE sector and, and 
is now a good time to invest in PE, basically. <laughs> yes and no. Yes and no. You know, there is always the contrarian view. So when everybody goes, they always said in the equity market, you know, if the taxi driver tells you to buy Tesla shares, it's the time to sell. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so <laughs> is it now a good time? Depends on what type of investor you are. If you are an investor that looks at distressed assets, maybe it is because we have an environment where we have high inflation, why? We have high inflation, of course, because we had the supply chain issue post-COVID, where many things were either not produced or couldn't be shipped. And that was like the first part of it. Then you had the high inflation. And now, of course, you have the high interest rate environment, meaning that even private equity funds that are highly leveraged, and some of them do a leverage of, you know, one to four, one to five. So they have one billion in, but they spend for five billion. Yeah, potentially, that they get a little bit in terms of their financial structure behind that leverage into difficulties, repaying debt, they have to reorganize their portfolios or the companies within the portfolios. So that makes the environment a little bit more precarious. And I looked at the latest uh, statistics, there is going to be over the next 12 months, a scarcity of companies to find higher competition, um, very, very hard environment in terms of raising funds, and not only for the first time funds, but also for the established funds, because people are just, okay, let's wait and see. Mm -hmm. We have interest rates, we have a war, we have starvation left, right and center. I mean, you know, we've got the force majeure, uh, the, the insurance companies, there's so much burning right now. But you know who has the fire hose, of course, is, is having a good time. Yeah. Mm. So as I was saying, people that are either sitting on cash and can afford with that cash, with that war chest, to buy distressed companies, sit them out, restructure them on the quiet, that when the market comes back, when financing conditions are starting to level off a little bit, that they can really make them a long-term profitable game. I would say for us, you I, personally, I always believe you make your opportunity and there's always opportunities in the market. And when everybody is hands off, it's your opportunity to be hands on. Mm -hmm. But this is, this is also a personal philosophy is when there is a loop jump in it, you, you can in that moment really create your fortune. But, you know, one thing is what people say also to the press and what you can read. And the other thing is what people do. And then you still see deals going through. You still see people raising 20 billion for whatever fund or just closing a 20 billion fund to focus on a certain vertical. That actually reminds me what is important right now to to get money from investors and raise capital is to be extremely focused on where you want to go. And really map out the road. People are just, okay, they're going, going to more details, wanting to know exactly how are you going to deploy the money and why there and how much do you expect from that company, that geography, that technology, da 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 to come by when. So their due diligence on you uh, is going to be tougher from an LP, from a limited partner, mm -hmm. investor side. And you have to be as tough, of course, on the assets which makes it harder to find good assets. So it's a bit of a tricky situation, but it's for everybody more or less the same, depending on how deep or not your pockets are. Mm -hmm. And imagine you manage to raise the funds, um, but of course we, we say there's a lag between the moment you receive the fund and actually when you invest in them or when you invest them. Um, so imagine you can't find the right companies. What happened in that case? Well, um, there is, there is of course, the fund structure where you commit to have spent the money uh, within a certain amount of time. And that is something what special purpose acquisition vehicles were known for. They mm -hmm. said, you give us the money and within the next two years, your money is invested. And as of that, you will be able to get some sort of return. That is a huge conflict of interest, if you ask me. Because um, when time, when time and the time window of you having to spend money gets shorter, you just go, oh, whatever. We just need to spend the money. So the pressure doesn't come, or the pressure is there to just spend the money because that is the commitment you gave. Did you give, give the commitment it's going to be only AAA valued companies or whatever asset it is? Maybe, maybe not, but I think it's a huge uh, conflict of interest. So an open-ended fund, of course, is something that is a lot more fluid and liquid. And uh, I think the liquidity events and the liquidity issue 
needs to be extremely well communicated and understood by an institutional, but especially by a private investor. Mm -hmm. And um, l let's talk about the all the initiatives now to make the asset class much more accessible. So we were talking earlier around about funds of funds, mm -hmm. which basically is the concept of pulling money together and enable you to enter even for a few thousands. Um, so what do you think of the concept and can these funds, because again, with the performance difference between top quartile and, and, and the others, can these kind of funds access the, the top performers? Well, you would hope so because you give <laughs> your, your, you know, your saved penny to what they call themselves a professional. Yeah. Mm. And we do know that the professionals got us to the financial crisis. We do know that it was the head of the Federal Reserve getting us into an interest rate uh, environment, which created a huge bubble. Again, that was a professional that all of us, savers and non institutional investors, trusted. Yeah. So, Talking about specifically funds of funds, I think the great upside here is you really can get into an asset class as a Joe blogs to which which would be precluded to you. So you can. Huh? Um, you have to pay fees. Um, I don't know. I've never invested in a fund of funds. How big the the actual fund fees are and whether they give you a guaranteed minimum rate of return. I don't know. I just know, for example, that mutual funds, even though they also invest in um, in alternative in alternative investments, most of them have like a maximum holding of I think about fifteen percent in illiquid assets. So they cannot go further in terms of their asset allocation than fifteen percent of their one billion dollar you know worth of funds into something they call an illiquid asset which private equity would be simply because as we were talking early on you have longer investment period cycles before you can get any kind of either dividend or a, a really uh, a carry um so from that point of view you as a private investor need to sounds so boring but you need to read the small print and uh, you then you just have to see what asset allocation you really want to give from your personal from your personal uh, money there are also some funds that i know that will only let you invest in their fund of fund structure in their mutual fund structure so and so much money if you have a private wealth of between one and a half, five million US dollars, so that you have enough <laughs> to live on, even if you lose the money or they lose their money, and you know you're trying to in a you know in a, in a court case sue some money even with a class action, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So again, the small print is uh, is quite important. I think everybody's just like with the cryptocurrencies or the blockchain technology or any kind of new or different asset class. If it's interesting to you, my my advice would be learn, 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 read, study podcasts, you know, see what's been happening in the past, see what, what researchers are looking on in the future and start small. Be prepared to lose the money and learn from that. Okay, so just say, okay, it's like, you know, paying the lottery, literally. Or even if you have a friend that wants to do a business and you kind of like that knitting online kind of thing, then, you know, and you have $5,000 or $10,000 to spare, which is a hell of a lot of money, but you like the person, you think it's a cute idea, it might, it might work. And that is your really hands-on experience into what, what I'm doing as a business angel or as a founding partner at Falco Global Partners. Nice words. I love that. And and I know you're super engaged in women empowerment. And so what would it be attractive for a woman to work in private equities? That's my first question. And second, being a woman, how like diverse the teams or the companies you invest in are? Because we know like the statistics are terrible. We're talking about 3% of the funds go to women um, funded companies. Mm -hmm. So is it a bit different with you? Yes. Um, I, I love that question because I always say when, when women ask me about, hey, how do you see women in a workplace and especially in the financial niche and then in the niche of private equity within the financial niche, okay? Um, let me answer that question first. Uh, we are very few. 
We are still very few. Uh, we are a lot of working bees within the structure, but there's very few that are partners, uh, founders, or um, fund managers. With regards to not that many fund managers being around is simply because these funds have a duration of 10, 12 years. And usually you don't tend to change the fund manager or the name, the brand during that period. It is a disaster from a PR point of view, branding point of view. Uh, investors get scared. You don't do that. Okay. And it is extremely competitive because the guys that had already two funds managed and has $5 billion worth of investment um, track record in history in his, on his career is more likely to get the next fund management role than you as a woman that is maybe hopefully for the first time being the head of a fund. All right. So here it's really the structure of the game and how early or not us women came into the game. And this is going to be taking quite a while, I think. So there's more and more women in our industry, but by far not enough women in those industry, be it the investment committee, be it the fund manager, simply because of how these things are structured. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Advice Super is interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other, the other um, question about female backed uh, companies or started by female entrepreneurs. We have both in the portfolio, okay? And I can tell you one thing, and this is not because you and I are women. You know, I don't label myself as feminist. I always say I'm feminine, not feminist. And I think what we bring to the table, diversity, not only in terms of what our sex is, but how we look at things, how we endorse or not things, how we see a bigger picture than most men see. I think we are hugely complementary. On the entrepreneur side, our very distinct, and you know, I'm there as as the only female as operational partner. The, the rest they are they are all male, right? The girls that we have as entrepreneurs are the only ones that are listening. That are when we are talking to them as investors, giving them operational guidance, doing things with them for them from building the pitch to building the brand to how do we go to market you know pricing strategy they're there going like yeah tell me we want to learn no ego i mean they have ego because they want to be their boss and they are boss they're setting up their companies and they're doing so but they're the first ones to uh that are open to improvement and us old guys huh, giving them some valuable advice they they suck up and implement and execute straight away. And we've seen that. Hmm? Whereas the male entrepreneurs, oh, they've seen it all. They've done it all. They're the best. Oh, no, I always don't. I mean, you talk like to a wall. You talk until you're blue in the face. You take them by the hand. And then even if it is your merit, it was their merit. Huge egos. Very, very difficult. So the operational model with male entrepreneurs so far, what we had at least, and I'm not generalizing, it's just really purely our our um, experience was an uphill struggle. Um, you know, um, day after day, we have our bi-weekly calls. We're extremely uh, involved in our companies. Uh, we go and visit them. They come over. I mean, it's really a close relationship, but, pff, mm. you know, it, it, even if they listen until they then implement or even execute is like, okay, this is, this is a huge time warp. Women, they want to succeed. They're still hungry. They're, we have still a chip on our shoulder, which works perfectly for, for ladies setting up their company. So, and I think we even said in our last partners meeting, which was last week, and we said, guys, we need to invest in more into female driven companies because, you know, the traction we've seen in comparison to the male, uh, male founders companies has been uh, exponential and exceptional in comparison. Okay. Love that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Patricia, for your time, for your all your explanation. It's been super clear. Thanks for yeah, shedding your lights, for opening the discussion and, and really giving value and, and linking concepts together. That's what I, I prefer. Um, so, yeah, thank you for this um, session, which was super informative, informative and empowering. Thank you so much. And I want to say, Manichel, I love it. I've been listening to your podcast. You've got super interesting guests. I feel honored to be part of it. 
I hope I'll be uh, helping to add value. And uh, of course, what we talked about is only scratching the surface. <laughs> and a lot more in private equity or females in business uh, to be to be investigated. But as long as you know, all of us, your podcast, my podcast, us uh, stay curious. I think um, there's a huge, huge scope to grow and to learn and be fascinated. Love that. Thank you so much. Together. Share together, we find our way together.